All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Ed Startup and this week's conversation with Mark Sermon from the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, Mark, welcome to the whatever this is, the broadcast. So, Happy to be here. Um, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and where you came from and how you got to where you are and what Mozilla Foundation is and, and what you do. It's a whole book, David. I don't know if I can tell you all those things. But um, glad to be here. And uh, I guess in, in, the, in the jargon of things like Ed Startup Entrepreneurs, uh, I guess I am a, a serial social entrepreneur and I've been making things for a better world probably since I was about 17. Um, so right now I'm executive director of Mozilla Foundation uh, and really the, I'm, you know, I'm the one who's pushed us to focus on web literacy and generally disruption in learning uh, as a major theme. Really actually is one of the big three things that Mozilla is focused on right now. Um, and for people who don't know, Mozilla is, uh, I mean, most people probably know Mozilla makes Firefox, uh, but many people don't know that Mozilla is actually a nonprofit um, that started out really almost 15 years ago, about to have our anniversary next year. And one of the things when I first showed up about four years ago, I had to do was deal with an IRS audit, the, kind of the week I came in the, the door. The advantage of an IRS audit was I had to go back and read every legal document that we ever wrote, including our original original incorporation documents from 2003. And incredibly inspiring. Strangely, you know, you don't normally go give a speech and, and quote your incorporation documents. I actually do it almost every time I talk. This says right in the opening paragraph uh, of our charter, Mozilla exists to guard the open nature of the internet. And, you know, that is an organization that uh, started by some very idealistic people who actually wanted to do that and believed that the open infrastructure of the internet was a, a key to innovation, a key to wealth creation, a key to the kind of society they wanted to build. Um, and, you know, why they built Firefox was not because they wanted to compete uh, in the web browser market and make a lot of money. Why they built, built Firefox was because they believed that the core infrastructure that the internet sits on, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then everything down the stack of the, of the network layer, was actually under threat because Microsoft had a monopoly in how people saw the internet and also in how those programming languages that make up web pages worked. Uh, and they're actually kind of pushing out um, those, those open, owned by nobody building blocks, which are called standards, um, you know, from, from the kind of mainstream of how people made web pages. And so this was a group of people who got together saying, we've got to make sure the Lego blocks stay open. Um, and, you know, that's why they made Firefox. And, and luckily, they were smart enough to have some people who said, if we want to do that, all we have to do is go out and compete with consumers. We need a shiny thing. We need a fast thing. I mean, a thing that, um, that uh, you know, kind of has some advantage that consumers really like, like pop-up blocking or, you know, being safe, you know, things that we kind of forget now because they happen, but really were major differentiators in the market in 2003 and 2004. Uh, so here was a group of people who said, let's go out, use the mainstream of the market to bring back web standards, really HTML, CSS, JavaScript, boring, but bring them back to relevance as the way that people make the digital world. And of course, you know, Mozilla has been incredibly successful at that part of, it, of its goal with, with Firefox. Um, and you know, when I kind of talk about that, I actually probably should have seen if I could have brought some slides, because I have some nice slides that show that transformation. And I kind of show the market share change and why Chrome and, and Safari coming along as strong HTML5 browsers is actually a part of the victory. Um, but you know, Leave it to say, just I think we're in a world where web standards are strong, and what it means is it's a set of building blocks that people can start businesses on, or start art projects on, or whatever the hell they do, without asking permissions from anybody, but also with a huge head start. And that's what open infrastructure is. It's those two things about being able to get a head start quickly and not to have ask anybody's permission to get started, to distribute, to do all those kind of things. Um, and so, you know, when I make that point. I throw up a nice lolcat screenshot and I say, you know, without us, without the web and the standards coming back, you probably wouldn't have had this. And in fact, it's around 2005, after um, web developers start switching back to cross-browser development, you start to get Ajax and, and kind of the idea of more interactive websites. You get Gmail where you don't have to constantly click reload on your webmail. You know, that things people start making more interesting things again around 2005 on the web. 
which had really kind of stagnated. So you know, one of those things is, is Lolcats, but the other is Facebook. And, and if you think about this as an entrepreneurship story, it, it really is you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Linux, and Apache that are the things that most of the things you see as big businesses are the starting blocks of. And that's what open infrastructure is. That is the wealth creation engine or the, or the, the wealth creation springboard that the internet has has kind of uh, started with. So, you know, that's what that's what Mozilla stands for. We said it very abstractly when we started out. We did it very concretely through Firefox. Um, we about four years ago when I came knew that we would want to do the same thing, but Firefox was was not in areas beyond Firefox. So we started up two labs projects, one of which I ran, one with more kind of core product focus, one called Drumbeat with more social focus. Uh, and by the end of 2011, so just you know this time last year, we had we made a decision on two things we would do uh, beyond Firefox to go after that same mission of guarding the open nature of the internet. Um, one is very much in the, the world of making sure that HTML5 or, or standards-based programming languages win in mobile just as much as, uh, as they have on the desktop. Because we don't live in the, the same world in mobile phones as we do on the desktop. You do have to ask permission if you have a new product to get out to the world. You have to, you know, we, we saw the most radical thing in history in terms of the democratization of distribution of goods with the URL. And, now, and so anybody could publish anything, good or bad, you know, full of love or full of evil, and we got lots of both, right? Um, but we got things, we, I think we got a world we like better. And we're now in a world on mobile phones and tablets where two companies, or two and a bit, uh, control the decision about publishing for all of humanity. So we've gone from the most radically decentralized system of distribution um, in human history to the most closed in a, in a very few short number of years and nobody's noticed. So, you know, we want to go back to the world where every, any URL is an app, where that app experience, which is great on mobile, I mean, we've, a whole bunch of innovation has happened in user experience where we can do computing on smaller devices that's great. Like, I mean, I, I live on my, my Android phone. Um, but we've also gotten to a much more closed distribution system. We've got to a world where the skills needed to, to develop on uh, that are, are much smaller. I think there's something like 600,000 iOS developers in the world and 8 million web developers. Um, you know, so the, the, the phones have kind of disconnected from the, the open generative world that we have on the web. So we're putting out uh, a Firefox OS, uh, which is a phone, smartphone operating system, just, which is just the web. Um, that's coming in mid next year. Uh, Brazil will be the first place that it comes out with Telefonica, um, and you know it's really meant to do what Firefox did to, to Internet Explorer, which is not to come out and beat iPhone and, and Android, but to come and push back to the to the point where the same set of programming language building blocks uh, are used across all the platforms. Right. So as you see, IE nine come out as being, you know, much closer to, say, Chrome and Firefox, like, that's the victory. So the thing we're going after with, with the phone is, is the same thing in phones and tablets that really all those 8 million web developers could be developing across any device. And you don't choose, oh, I'm buying this app for home and this app for my tablet and this app for my phone. Um, and we just think that's critical. That, that plus the ability to, that there could be a long tail of millions of marketplaces, or that a URL that I text to you can be an app. You know that we get back to the distribution system we have now. Uh, you know that that's critical. And then the third thing that we're we're doing now, that the second new thing that came out of our labs is something called Mozilla Webmaker, and that is face focus on the idea that um, if we want the next two billion people to get online to get this access to the same kind of opportunities that we all had. Um, and that's, you know, that's the kind of numbers that are coming online in the next couple of years. We both need an open mobile platform because that's where they're, they're coming. We actually also need people to have the skills to understand how that works, how to hack it, how to create with it. And so Mozilla Webmaker is a set of products as well as a kind of a global community that's meant to dramatically increase the kind of web literacy skills and co-literacy skills of, of people around the world. 
we really are aiming to produce products and programs that can look at you know hundreds million hundreds of millions more people actually understanding how the web works and, and how to code, how to shape their own digital environment. And we'll do that by, you know, the, the, the simplest way to explain today's version of our hunch uh, is we'll do that primarily by creating social media and creativity tools that let you do more than you can do now on Facebook or Tumblr or YouTube, uh, but do it in a way that as you do more, you learn more. Uh, and as you peel back the layers, you get more power. And so, for example, Part of that Mozilla Webmaker initiative uh, is something called Mozilla Popcorn. And on one level, Mozilla Popcorn is, is a kind of way of just publishing a video on the web. Um, but you know, there's, there's two differences, probably three, um, right out of the bat, even though it's just in its 1.0. One is every video that you publish has a remix button. Or if you, you think back to web pages from you know, when you first saw them in 1994 or 1995, videos that have a view source button. And so when I click that, I can actually see all the pieces that are inside of that video. And I can move them around, or I can understand how a technique was done, or I can go see what, what was the source file. And so that's actually you know, a pretty interesting and powerful thing, because right now, a video is a thing that got spat out of somebody's iMovie somewhere. And if you want to kind of understand how it, how it got made or take a piece of it, it, it's really, it doesn't work like the rest of the web in that way, right? You can't understand what, what what, is, what it came from. And then the other thing, you know, beyond that is it, it's something that is connected to the rest. Popcorn, the videos that you can make there are connected to the web, rest of the web, where the, the web is your edit bin or your raw footage. So right now, if I want to make video to kind of drag it all into iMovie or Final Cut Pro or, or Premiere or whatever, um, but much of the stuff we actually want to share with each other in, in something that feels like a video is a, a screen capture, is data from an API, is content that's already in Facebook that is. And so Popcorn is in the early stages of being literally a, a, an iMovie for all of the content on the web in real time, because it works on URLs. Effectively, the videos you're creating are moving web pages. They just happen to be in a frame. And they're collecting assets from all across the web and rendering them and turning them into a video in, in real time. So it's both you know, video that you. Uh, can view source on, remix, and it's kind of open and like that. But it's also a video that literally works like the web because it's pulling stuff together from the web in real time and making it into a, a, a video. And then you know the the third thing that it um, that it can do is start to teach you about how the web works because what it is is you're making a video out of the web. You know you, you think it's funny um, to say okay, well, what it might teach you is what URLs are. Most people have kind of forgotten. Right? But and a URL is a very powerful thing. It's a, it's a way to tunnel through the internet and pull something back out. Um, and where it'll teach people what APIs are, or it'll teach people that the web is actually made of different pieces, which, you know, that Lego-ness of the web is a great part of its power, and it's actually not something that people understand. And once you understand that, you start to have a lot more capabilities. So it can teach you that. Um, it also is wrapped in a kind of an HTML page that you click a remix button on that, and it'll very easily kind of let you uh, edit and pimp out your page. So much like MySpace, which we've kind of lost, uh, you know, there's an invitation in all of these products to say, pimp it as much as you want, change it as much as you want. It's the opposite of, uh, of a kind of Facebook experience. And so the WebMaker thing is really oriented towards new creativity and social media products um, that will also expose you to much more of the texture underneath the internet. Um, and we think if we can get, make those popular, uh, we can really, uh, and also give out badges um, that tell you you're learning something. Because the thing is, you know, a good product uh, lets you learn that stuff out of your own inquisitiveness and out of your own desire to say something. Uh, if you then have flags saying, hey, you learned something, um, that also kind of increases the consciousness of what's going on and maybe incents you to dig deeper. So that's a little bit about who Mozilla is and why and what we're working on right now. Thanks. Thanks. Well, um, so you know, listening to you say those things, it makes me think that you know, Cory Doctorow is talking about this war on ubiquitous computing right now at the same time that Doug Rushkoff is talking about um, you know, this idea that we either have to learn to program or we will, we will be programmed. Right. Um, but you don't hear those two conversations kind of run together in sort of the way that you're talking about them. And so what, what really is at the intersection of that war on ubiquitous computing at, uh, at this idea that you have to be able to program or you will be programmed 
and then opportunities for people, whether it's traditional entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship, save the world kind of stuff like you and I love to talk about. But what's happening at the nexus of all of that? I mean, you're starting to address it. In and say, say a little bit more, David. What's Corey's ubiquitous uh, computing thesis? It rings a bell, but... Yeah, so this idea that, the, that there's a war on ubiquitous computing, that, computing that can do anything, that anybody can do anything with, as opposed to platforms that are locked oh, in, on, on definition to get an app onto. It's the, it's the war on open-ended platforms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean... The, but Mozilla right now is the nexus of those two things. We we believe both of those th two theses. Uh, you know, Firefox OS is the is about generative platforms, um, and it's you know there is a war on that, uh, and um, and at the same time the WebMaker stuff is exactly the, the Douglas Ruskoff stuff. And in fact, we've had him kind of come on to some of our community calls. So. We believe you actually need to go after both of those things together. And, and where it fits into the entrepreneurship thing is you need to go after both of those things together if you like the world we live in now uh, in, the, in the sense that we've, the Internet and the culture of the Internet and the entrepreneurship on the Internet make it better. And some people don't like that world. Uh, but if you like that world, you think it's good for humanity, you need both of those things. You need the skills. You need them at a mass level. You need the understanding. It needs to be baked into our society. It needs to be treated like a, a fourth literacy. And you need the platforms that have the capabilities for people to tinker and invent and you know, find out what's next and, and make them be unexpected things. And so how that, I mean, how that fits back to entrepreneurship it goes to my kind of two billion comment, right? Is um, you know, the the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, as much as we can trash Facebook as a part of the problem in terms of, of kind of open and generative systems, it's kind of siloed things off, it, it's not very flexible. Uh, a lot of the people, uh, I don't know if it's true exactly of Facebook, but a lot of the people who have kind of come with open APIs that are part of that are starting to close them. You know, so, so there's, those people are a part of that. But we never would have seen them without the, the kind of ease of being able to learn those technologies. Uh, and the open building blocks that are there, the laptops that do anything, the Linux and Apache stack, the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So, like, if we really, from a, I, for me, it's a justice perspective. We could even look at it just from a greed perspective. Uh, want the next two billion people to have the same opportunity to become a Zuckerberg, or you know, become a, you know, the the next Muhammad Yunus who actually invents uh, a banking system on his you know laptop. Um, you need both of those things, right? And uh, and so, I, I trust you know that that's what's fascinating when we get into kind of policy fights around the open internet and and or kind of really kludgy copyright law or whatever is so much wealth has been created by those two things, right? By the the knowledge of how to program. And you know, the, basically, an open set of Lego blocks that you can get a fast start with, right? And that that is the bit like. And it, I was talking to a bunch of people at an event yesterday about this. Like, if we just could get that number or that metric, like how much wealth has been created by those two things, why are we even talking about anything else? Um, but then well, we're, we're talking about something else because the guy, the first guy in that wins, wants to hold on to winning, right? right I mean, right. the example that you're giving is just like Walt Disney coming along and remixing Steamboat Willie into Steamboat Mickey and taking advantage of things in the public domain and some flexibility, uh, maybe that existed in copyright at the time, and now saying every time the copyright on Mickey is about to run out, we need to extend it another 20 years because, by golly, I don't want anybody else being able to do what I was able to do first times through. I was the first guy here. I win. I don't want anybody else on the top of the hill because I'm occupying that territory, right? Yeah, no, I mean, of, of course, that that is the, the real reason. But I think especially as entrepreneurs, people here in, in this class, um, you know, we're not the incumbents. And uh, and so I guess the, the nice thing about Mozilla, you know, assuming we can succeed, and it, there's, that's a far from a guarantee in either of the two new initiatives that, that we're kind of talking about. They're very ambitious, and there's lots of people who would not want us to win. Um, but you know, assuming we succeed, we're lucky enough to be sort of semi-incumbent, uh, or or you know, we kind of have a voice, have people's attention. Um, but we only care that the system stays you know open enough for the new guys. And 
And I think anybody who is the new guy, anybody who's a startup, has to be a voice and an advocate for, um, you know, for, for kind of an open infrastructure. What's interesting, I don't know if this is taking it too off course for this conversation, is we're at a an interesting inflection point where um, a few of the new incumbents benefit from the system being at least somewhat open. Um, and that actually is a one kind of positive thing that I don't know you see at these inflection points in history very often. So, you know, the the URL and the kind of the idea that basically everything on the internet is exposed and there's a single addressing system is right at the core of, of what remains Google's core business model, right? So the fact that that all the information you get in Facebook is actually behind a wall and is not a set of public URLs means that a significant chunk of the of the internet no longer is no longer available to businesses the Google's business, right? Um, and you know, similarly, uh, Amazon and web, you know, what they do with web services, which becomes an increasingly large part of their business, is based on a, kind of the ubiquity of the open source web delivery stack, right? And the fact that everybody wants it, that it's a, a core commodity upon which all this stuff is is built. Um, so to some degree, I think we saw that in the SOPA debate. Um, there are people who are becoming the new incumbents who are part of a, a the problem in some ways, but are also part of the, the solution in, in that they've, they've built their businesses on the open infrastructure so much that, um, you know, if you go too far in trying to wreck it, um, they've got to stand up and help you defend it. Yeah. Um, well, let me pivot for a minute. What we're talking about uh, entrepreneurship in the education space, particularly, and the work that Mozilla is doing with badges. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I think about badges in the early 2010s now the same way I think we were thinking about blogs in the late 2000s, right? That publishing used to be a space that was a, it required a lot of expertise. Professionals are the ones who publish. Only people who are trained in a certain way really have anything worth saying, and we would only want to empower, I mean, why on earth would we want to empower every person in the world to easily, affordably, openly be able to participate in some kind of larger conversation? And there were people that thought that blogs would be the, I don't know, the, the end of intellectual discourse or something. And, and, and like you said before, there's great, there's great good there, there's great evil there, there's all kinds of things going on. But yep. the blogs have clearly democratized participation in the conversation, right? And it seems to me like badges very much are about democratizing uh, credentialing or, rec or democratizing the recognition process in the same way that blogs democratize people participating in the, in the broader dialogue. Is that the way that Mozilla thinks about it, or is it slightly different? Or well, certainly, it's certainly how I think about it, and I, I think it's at the heart of, of a bunch of the analysis of why we are getting into badges in the way that we are. Um, the I mean, there's probably three different threads to kind of take this on. Um, I guess the, the first I would say um, for this audience, because it's a, an entrepreneurship audience. I think figuring out good ways to use badges to motivate people and credential people in a way that is going to be credible is the, the entrepreneurship opportunity of, of the next decade, right? And we're actually probably not going to figure it out. We're, we're using badges both on our own uh, for our webmaker stuff. So we have badges for, for web literacy, which, you know, that's how we kind of got into this in the first place. But then, of course, we have the open badges infrastructure, which is a, a bigger play to encourage the, the kind of badges as a, as a big thing. And I, I think jumping on that and figuring out how to give badges that people believe in, like if you can do that uh, and it's hard, um, there, is, there is money in that. Um, and so I, I think... Probably was true, you know. If Ariana Huffington was sitting back there, you know, figuring out she'd start a blog, uh, you know, would she become an important political voice, and would she get acquired by AOL, or whatever it was, you know, because she was tenacious, knew how to provide the right value, talk to a particular audience. I think, you know, that the Ariana Huffingtons of, of badges are are out there in that way. Um, you know, I think the the next piece in terms of how we we think about them, like, certainly is beyond the opportunity of the individual entrepreneur and the need for people to do this stuff that rocks and, and prove it to the market and make money in the market, there is definitely 
um, a democratization opportunity there, similar and possibly bigger than um, than blogs. Um, and uh, and that's just that if if you have twenty or a hundred or a thousand entrepreneurs who actually can give blogs that have or sorry badges that that are believable. Um, then you have something that snaps together. Then you have something that actually threatens the big institutions, or actually solidifies the fact that the big institutions are already threatened. And and the the main thing that's exciting about that certainly it'd be great to be in a world where there's enough use of things like badges that we can actually all just sit down and stop worrying about the fact that we learn everywhere, right? Like that we do, we know it. So like, why can't we make it credible? Um, so that would be nice. But I think what it also potentially does is if badges become meaningful in the market, not just the level of one or two successful cases, um, it starts put, putting pressure on all corners of the system to provide more value to learners. And I think ultimately that's the social outcome that we want from this. And that's going to take decades. Um, but you know the just you, you've seen it in blogs. We, we work a lot in journalism innovation, so you know we have partners like the New York Times and the Guardian and the BBC and da -da -da. all of these people. None of them are are anymore saying, "Oh my God, this guy is following blogs." Uh, you know, some of them are still saying, "Oh, this guy is following business mo models." But the ones that are have a deep tradition of you know founded an idea that journalism is a cr credible, important. Um, kind of bedrock of democracy, um, and who have the resources, uh, they're not worried. They see that the terrain is just shifting, but their mission stays the same, right? So, the New York Times is a perfect example. Now, yes, they're wealthy, but maybe actually what we need is some wealthy, well resourced journalistic organizations of the quality of the Times, which, ha which is owned by a trust. And has a charter about journalism that, that underpins a, a kind of a civic function, and which manages and, and hires the CEO, uh, as does the Guardian. Like maybe those bigger weights uh, that that form that function, combined with the blogosphere, is is what the kind of value that citizens need. So maybe you know Harvard or Stanford or or MIT or or Oxford stay in those roles, right? Or maybe you know research universities are, are really just research universities. Or maybe in, who knows what, what happens. Or maybe we hybridize and we accept we move fluidly across the edges of traditional educational institutions and, and other things. But I think ultimately, if if badges are successful in the market, what it does is it provides that scenario where the New York Times is no longer worried about bloggers. It's figuring out what's its role as a storied, wise, well-resourced institution in that ecology of, of information. So that's, I think, where if we're all successful, and I think the, the, the kinds of startups that people would come out of this course and do are successful, that's what we get, is not a crisis in education, but actually a really good situation where we can talk about the roles of different kinds of companies and institutions and, and individuals. And it, you know, badges are not the wedge that's going to do that, but they're a part of it. Uh, I think. And then there is a third piece about badges which is critical and it's where I often talk about badges being uh, more like email in the late 80s uh, or early 90s than, than like blogs and that you know people, I know David and I are old enough, I don't know about anybody else on, on this call, uh, to remember when if I had email on CompuServe and you had email on Source or I had email on this university network and you had you know email on this business network, we couldn't communicate with each other. Um, and that's where we are and will be with badges unless something like Open Badges is successful. The, you know, the success of email is only because uh, of protocols like SMTP that said, oh, well, we, you know, this is an open standard. Let's just all use it to send email across all systems. Uh, and so we, we need something simple like SMTP if we want credentialing to be something that can be offered a lot of different places um, that that credentialing shows up and, and is understandable and verifiable across any other badges system. And you know, there's been dozens or hundreds of email clients over the years, and there's been innovation in 
whether we were on webmail or on our desktop. And you know, if, if this had been 10 years ago, we all would have been on Microsoft Outlook and probably everybody here has a Gmail account. What hasn't changed is SMTP. And, uh, and to a certain degree, the, the delivery protocol is POP and IMAP, although that's different in relationship to, to this kind of ubiquity question. And so what we're trying to do with Open Badges, and I, I hope we've got the core of it right, and, we, and if we don't, we want people to push on it, is basically have that SMTP for uh, educational credentials. So if this becomes popular, this stuff moves, my staff can move around with me into my different contexts. And that's uh, critical, or we get you know stuck with you know it feels like email from the '80s, and that's not really good for anybody. Yeah, the, the email from the '80s example takes me back, and I'm I'm going to resist the urge to to reminisce a little bit about my old Bitnet account uh, at, at the university. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to give it back to you, uh, David, if, and take away your Gmail and see how you feel. Can I just jump in and ask, you talked about badges and, and just some of the incredible opportunities that that opens up, but can you just give a specific example or two for anybody who may be listening who is, is less familiar with what badges are about, you know, maybe a few, but you know so many projects that are doing this already, uh, some of the awesomeness that's already happening because of badges and then how people could get involved if they aren't already. Right. So, I mean, uh, yeah, so if, if we step back, I assume that you guys had already had 12 lectures on badges. So, um, the, But if we step back, I mean, really, people are, d are kind of debating this in, in different ways, but, uh, you know, badges just mean a, a micro-credential. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think the word badges is great because if I say micro credential, you can get a badge, you can sort of you, you, you mentally can grok that, you can understand what I mean. Sometimes it also trivializes it and people think of it as uh, you know like a Foursquare badge or a or um, a Boy Scout badge. Although a Boy Scout badge is a micro credential in ways. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know that's what really we're talking about is small granular credentials that if I took an individual course I could get, if I went and tried to assert that I had an existing skill or skill level that there might be somebody who would, would test me on that or, or vouch for me on that. Uh, it could be that I've, I've completed a particular thing or achieved something in life uh, or, or in the workplace or in, in school and then it's tied to that achievement. So there's lots of ways that one might want to record you know, things you know or things you've achieved or um, vouching or, or affirmations. In fact, you see this, this kind of vouching piece becoming quite popular in LinkedIn right now as they've kind of added this, this vouching function. And, and you know, why does anybody care about any credentials? Or why would you care about being able to assert an individual skill, you know, like I know HTML, uh, or you know, an individual achievement, like I made this really beautiful web page, or uh, you know, and a vouching, like you know, David says, Mark's a really hot coder. Um, and it, it's because we use credentials to kind of signal as we go into different contexts um, what it is we know, what it is we're good at, you know, what kind of uh, insight, skill, social capital do I kind of bring to the table. Um, and, and in a digital world where I move through lots of different contexts, even if I, I move physically through that, all those different contexts, um, I'm getting so many skills, I'm building up social capital in so many ways, um, but I don't have any way to kind of wrap those things around my digital identity in, or my identity at all. And certainly, the, the ways that we've relied on uh, credentials, you know, things we've relied on to, to have as credentials in the past, which are big degrees or certifications, um, don't map at all to the kind of I'm picking stuff up as, as I go. And so, the, you know, the web developer example that I gave one is the one that we're most involved in, uh, you know, trying to create a set of badges. And, and I can actually pop a link in here somewhere if I can, or we can go just to the Mozilla log, blog, but we just launched a set of webmaker badges which are about learn like people um, going and earning basic web skills, but they'll also have over time the ability for that kind of vouching uh, function as well, which is important, you know, yes, maybe in getting a job, like ultimately I think that's gonna be one of the kinds of values that if you're an entrepreneur here, you could use badges for is if people are using a service that that you offer or people have skills that you might be able to get them to come and assert and you could test them on them. Um, getting a job is a big motivator of why I might want to have badges. And, and, you know, for people who don't know, the open badging system, the kind of SMTP of certifications that I, I talked about with David, 
includes a bunch of kind of encryption and signing components where it's um, that, that make it pretty certain that you actually did earn that badge. So that's you know that's good in terms of being able to get a job or whatever. But the other part of it is is just as I move through different contexts, like maybe I come and I, I want to work on an open source project with Richard, or I think he's doing something really, uh, you know, really cool. You can check out what I'm good at really quickly with that. It starts to give you a bunch of, of information that you can say yes, no, or more importantly, like, oh, I need help with this thing or that thing because I didn't know you did this. Um, and so the, you know, the power of, say, being able to gather up my whole portfolio of work, things that I've gone and, and done that I can kind of assert as skills and who has vouched for me um, is, is incredibly powerful in a digital world, whether you want a job or want to collaborate with people or, or just want people to kind of know who you are. So, Mark, kind of picking up on that, I think badges as the metaphor between badges and blogs, I think we, you know, a lot of us have heard, and between badges and email, when you think about badges as a bunch of small assertions about you that you kind of aggregate around the web and that follow you around the web and that might give you the opportunity to make assertions to certain people about what you're good at and what you're not, have you, heard, have you thought or heard people talk about uh, badges as cookies? Cookies, like, like in a, in a uh, motivational sense or as a trail? No, as, like browser cookies. Bad, badges oh, as browser cookies. I see. Um, in that they unlock capabilities or in that they track you or both? They, they track you in order to unlock capabilities, right? Right, right, I see. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah, but so in, a, in a good sense of cookies as opposed to the bad sense of right, cookies. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and actually, fr frankly, at the... See, I mean, it's kind of where we get into semantic questions, which I, I hate to do because I'm surrounded by a bunch of educational theorists who will spend all day talking to me about these things. But, I mean, it does get to a little bit of a... A question of where you draw the line of what's an actual badge and what is your kind of learning accrual system, right? Because at, at a certain point, um, it, in our stuff, we've got micro badges, which in the WebMaker system actually unlock different levels and different capabilities, and, and a lot of that actually starts to become very game-like in, in its use. Um, and I, it's fine to call those badges or micro badges, and they're based on exactly the same infrastructure and, and algorithms. Um, but I think, but I think that they're a little bit different in that they're they're much more about the, almost the game mechanics of of what's going on. Um, but yes, I, I think no question. As we start to um, gather more information about what we know, there's no questions that we will ourselves or people around us will use that as ways to provide incentives, make, make sure only the qualified people show up at the table. Like, There's all kinds of, of ways in which you can already see people using it that way. And I, and I think it, you know, it, it, it's actually at the heart of this gamification debate, which is um, you know, games in the, are the part of the digital world where we're most experienced as a society in providing um, a digital experience that unfolds based on what I've proven my ability to do. Um, and I think that there, you know, there's nothing wrong with providing experiences like that. They're good for some things. They're not good for other things. I think they're probably good for, for more than just fun. Um, they require an incredibly different kind of mind to do well. Um, so I, mean, I think that that becomes a part of, of this whole discussion. So let, let, let's not pass over the opportunity here talking about kind of accruing information about ourselves in the context of badges to say something about persona. I think most people's first, if they know persona at all, their, their first interaction with it was uh, in the beta version of the, the badge backpack. Right, right. Th th talk about persona and what, what it's trying to do and why it fits into to this broader vision that you've outlined. So Persona, uh, for people who don't know, is Mozilla's kind of open identity or first open identity offering. Um, and you can think of it as being like a, a standard, standards-based version of Facebook Connect, I think is the simplest uh, thing that, that people can understand. And it's a, it's a way that you can have one account, one password that moves across many different sites. But we're trying to do that in a way that you control the data 
it's there with you in your browser or it's there with you on your phone. Um, and, and frankly, it's there with you in a way that's not tied, doesn't feed back to one centralized source uh, information about everything you've done everywhere you're logged in. And, and so I think for those people who are, are concerned, there's many benefits to having a system like Persona. It's one of them is also that it works as federated identity. And so Persona is a system that anybody could deploy, Google could deploy it, you guys could deploy it, we could deploy it. And once I have an account on one Persona server, it, it works you know, across all of them. So it's a, it's a decentralized system. And so I think you know, some of the reasons we decide to make something like Persona is we do want people to be in control of their own data, whereas if you use Facebook Connect or Twitter uh, to log into things, they then track what you do on all of those other websites. And so for people who care about that level of tracking, um, these single sign-on systems are a, a pretty big vector of exposure, and, and Mozilla's got a much different attitude about privacy uh, than than either of those folks. Um, and then, you know, the the other um, piece of it is um, you want uh, a system that isn't controlled by one vendor. And and while we'll be the first ones to make Persona, it's designed to be a multi-vendor, multi-deployment, federated system. Um, and uh, and so we've deployed it with badges because we think you know what will happen if if we're successful and what's to some degree happened with Facebook Connect but not quite is that people will people will once they have strong digital identities which they basically do with Facebook and Gmail right now but once they have strong digital identities that are trusted and that are theirs and are not at the center of some other vendor system. I think people will be more willing to then attach different things to the side of that, right? Attach my financial power to that identity or financial, my, my educational credentials or what I know to that and so on. And so if, once I have a trusted digital identity that's mine, I can imagine putting on little backpacks or little pouches or whatever to take these other more extended aspects of my identity with me digitally and effectively that, that identity is my, my electronic agent on the internet. And, and so that's the world we're trying to get to, is a trusted identity that you're willing to trust to be your electronic agent. And so we, we attach badges to that, um, A, because you, you need an identity to attach badges to, but also B, uh, or sorry, we attach open badges to that, because um, you, know, you need a, a single identity, but also because that we're trying to explore this concept is, can we make a thing that's credible enough that people trust it? And are they willing to attach something that is of extra value to that and carry it around? And again, I think you'll see other stuff. Maybe it's health records. Maybe it's um, your financial uh, information. Who knows? And I know Richard had a, another question he wanted to jump in uh, with, at least one more. Uh, Richard, you want to hop in here? Yeah, I mean, I think you've actually already addressed a part of it in, in these examples you've been marked, but I'm just curious if you think about uh, what the role, how the potential for badges will shift and change what we think about with uh, the structure of traditional universities. So we recently held a, a, a summit, at the U.S. Department of Education held a summit for higher ed institutions about what's what's the future look like and how do we accelerate innovation. So do you have any specific uh, sort of suggestions on how... Uh, uh, leveraging using badges for, for those folks that are working with in the higher ed space could help uh, push innovation along. Any any uh, sort of next steps that you would give folks in those roles that might be participating? Yeah, it's a it's a hard one for me. You know, partly because I don't know that space, um, but you know, partly because I, I think you know those in institutions are so so tied to. A, you know, much bigger grained um, certifications, uh, and so I guess you know the the obvious thing is be willing to to listen to badges, you know, as a part of your intake process, as a you know part of admissions as, as they become popular. And I think that the the first sets of universities that you know we're still at least five years away from this, but that see bad people coming with with badges. Are thoughtful about what those badges tell them about the people who are applying to that university, and then let you know let people in. Maybe even though they got worse grades than the other people, or maybe they dropped out of high school, or like who knows what. But then they track. You know, once they they do that and are able to track 
the educational performance uh, or learning performance of those people who came in with badges over the, the say four years of their undergraduate degree, that'll start to be interesting, right? So I think, you know, the, certainly all universities have problems with admissions, or most universities have problems with admissions. Like, do they know what they're getting? Uh, and then, so if there is a way to kind of use badges as a way to know what they're getting and to get better, and then to actually see if that has an impact, I think that's actually a, a simple and really important role for for universities in in the next decade on this stuff. Um, and I guess the you know the other thing which is is much more courageous, and I don't think you'll see it naturally in the in the MOOC world, but maybe that's the place to to see it in the edXs and the um, Coursera's and, and so on. Although the, the edXs are interesting and the Coursera's, I guess, because they're more tied to actual universities and not just spin-outs from universities. Um, to be to be looking at real micro certifications that are backed by those universities, right? Like, if I can actually get a, a Harvard badge that means something from edX, um, that'll that'll be interesting. I haven't seen the uh, willingness yet amongst those players to, to think that way because it, it's a lot of, I think they perceive it as a lot of brand risk. Um, but if they really wanted to stretch, um, you know, I, I think there's something there. And I think maybe there's a hybrid uh, model too, right, where you're saying, look, institutions are still going to give traditional course credits and traditional diplomas, but along the way, there are skills that are being learned that we can be capturing in badges, uh, which doesn't blow up the existing system, but is kind of a hybrid which still allows students to leave with these tangible skills that they've documented, which could be helpful for finding jobs as, as well. So there may be a kind of a middle of the road there that, that people can consider. Yeah, could be. It's 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 definitely the it's definitely whenever it's a topic that comes up all the time and it's, it's never one that I end up having quite that. I mean, I guess I, I never end up having the light bulbs on. Maybe the way to do it is to throw the question back, right? I can imagine how some of the entrepreneurs who are on this will, you know, if I say you go out and figure out how to provide badges that are gonna produce value, and I, we don't know how to do it, but I know that there's entrepreneurs on here who can do it. Maybe they say the same thing of people who are inside of, of universities. Like, there's got to be a way that this can help provide more relevance, provide better learning, uh, open up the edges of your institution. I don't know how to do it. Like, go figure it out. Well, I mean, two, two things I would say. One is that there are several of us that already offer badges in association with our courses. I mean, starting this last winter, I started offering badges. You, you don't count, you David, David Wiley. Wiley. Oh, shut up, Mark. <laughs> but but the, the other thing I think You're is, an outlier. is listening, to, listening to you talk about SMTP and about how email used to work at universities, I think the very sensible and really believable, actually, next step uh, for a lot of this is for the companies that make student information systems that produce transcripts, uh, you know, that students pay 30 bucks a pop to get one copy of their own data, you know, to buy their own data back from the university. Yep. I, I think if SET or SunGuard or somebody just said, look, in the next version of our student information system, in addition to having traditional transcripts, side by side with that, we're going to convert each course into a badge. Yep. And you'll have, you know, you'll get BYU badges, uh, which you'll just get a, a different version of your transcript, which is a standards conforming version of your transcript. That, that is a brilliant idea. idea. And, and, you know, we, we're not talking about little skills. We're not talking about changing pedagogy. We're not talking about new systems. We're just talking about a little add-on feature to the SIS that translate the transcript that's already there into a standards-based language so that it becomes interoperable like email systems did. And then you yep. get desktop yep. clients, and you can get web-based clients, and you can get people adding value and building services around that. We just need a little cooperation, you know, from one or two of the big SIS vendors to give us this different view into our data. Yep, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that, I, I hadn't thought about the, that, but it's a, it's an easy thing to go, want to go after. Richard, we're, we're, we're kind of under the 10-minute uh, window here. Any other kind of wrap-up questions that you want to ask? Anything popping up in Twitter? Uh, you know, uh, one thing I would just say, and, and Mark, we sort of asked this of everybody here, so you're talking to a whole group of, of uh, entrepreneurs in the ed space that are thinking about what they're going to do, and uh, I would just ask you, you know, if you were in their shoes, what would you look at? Where do you see the low-hanging fruit? Where do you see, uh, you know, just an obvious opportunity that, that they should be aware of and should take advantage of? 
So I mean, I, I'm a little biased by the the stuff we're interested in and, and doing, but you know, I, I certainly think number one low hanging fruit is, is what I said before, which is you know, use badges to provide real value in a way that people are going to believe that that there's learning there. So there's all kinds of things that go into there around assessment, around brand, around you know, is what you're learning something people really want, like all those kind of things. But like, I think. Being able to do something that for a small amount of money or, or paid for by some ancillary source, people can come and learn stuff that they're desperate to learn, they're hungry to learn, that you can affirm that they've learned and then send them out into the marketplace. That's the, you know, that's the low hanging fruit and, and what the actual things in that are, I don't know. Um, I guess the, the place I would look for those things is one of the reasons that actually led us down this path and towards web making in the first place is um, Things that people are hungry for that traditional education does shittily. Uh, and so, you know, the, the web actually turns out, like, tech skills related to the web turn out to be one of those things, right? Computer science as a discipline hates the web. Uh, and even most community colleges that, that teach web development, you know, it's, it's slow. I mean, these are skills that happen all the time. And there's a tremendous amateur demand for these skills. And so you look for verticals like that, right? Universities and colleges do them badly. Um, people really want them. But I actually think that there's probably tremendous fertile space in, in language learning um, around badges for that reason, right? It's something that practical skill people want. People love to be able to show that they can have it for job reasons. So badges are awesome. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of language learning you get in traditional institutions is not very good. I mean, if you go to do a degree in Spanish or French, it's because you're going to become a scholar in Spanish or French, not because you actually want to go be able to get a job and go work in, you know, Bogota, right? So I actually think that, that language learning like the web, and there's probably other verticals like that, is a space where you could go in and do a lot of innovation and potentially make some money and where some of these new techniques like badges and peer learning, um, you know, play out together. Those are my two. Awesome, thank you. Oh, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Mark, uh, so we're, we're right up against the hour here. Any, I mean, are there any questions that we should have asked you that we didn't ask, comments that you wanted to make that you didn't get a chance to, things you didn't get a chance to say in the context of our conversation here, whether it's about the foundation, about the broader space, or or maybe a call for people who are interested in entrepreneurship to think more about social entrepreneurship than just traditional entrepreneurship, maybe? Yeah, well, I mean, I think education and learning is, a, is an opportunity. And I don't think we've seen the sweet spot in this at all yet uh, for you know social entrepreneurship and, and, and creating personal wealth um, to fit very well together. I mean, there's – maybe I get – hammered for saying stuff like this because I mean teachers work hard and universities are stretched and all this kind of stuff but there is so much fat in the system uh, and it's not fat in the system because anybody is evil or anybody's even stupid it's just we have an industrial uh, model of how you're doing this which is about premises which is about chalkboards which is about all of these kind of things and it, it just doesn't work with the economic environment that we live in and that's going to get disrupted and transformed. Uh, and so I guess, you know, the, the thing I would really just say is to, to be, whether you're in this for, for money or you're in this for love, and hopefully you're in it for both, I think there's tremendous a chance to be a social entrepreneur who advances the cause of learning in dramatic ways. Uh, and because you, cause just by not being as slow or, or kind of fat or expensive. I mean, maybe that's more fair to say just slow and expensive, right? I think that you can have tremendous social good by being fast and affordable or fast and cheap. Um, and, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I would certainly encourage people to think that they can be both uh, for the betterment of learning and, and create good businesses and that in a, an environment where your competitors are slow, so slow and expensive, it you know, shouldn't be so hard. I guess, actually, I would say one more thing that we learned from MacArthur. Now, we may be wrong about this, but we've got more and more people side by side with us uh, in it, is um, to point outwards from anything that traditionally calls itself education and play in the space that, uh, you know, focus on learning, and but just go directly to customers or go directly to parents or go directly wherever. 
um, that trying to think that you're selling into the some people will do that, but trying to think that you're selling into education, I think, is a dangerous game. Uh, trying to figure that uh, you know there are people who want to learn things, or want more capabilities in their lives. Uh, I think that's a faster place to go, and and again, a place where you can be uh, you know fast, nimble, and have impact on learning. Yeah, that, that's a message that uh, that we've gotten before. That this idea that instead of selling into schools or or trying to work with education, you should compete with it head to head, or uh, that you know that these side by side direct direct to learner models are, are more interesting in, in a bunch of ways for for a lot of the reasons that you're just indicating here. Yeah, and it's not mutually exclusive. I mean, I, I think if we're going to finish uh, on on this, you know, a lot of people take a lot of shots at Khan Academy, including me. I mean, I, I don't think it's a particularly innovative pedagogy. Um, but the fact that it starts, you know, it's got a very Silicon Valley attitude. It starts with consumers who are the kids and the parents who want to learn, and it's sneaking into schools through the back door. And so even if you do want to impact schools, uh, thinking like a t consumer technology company, getting to people who are going to be excited about what you have to offer, Go into the low-hanging fruit customers who just get it right away, and making your snowball from that and rolling it down the hill. Uh, I mean, I think that's the right thing to do. It's what we're trying to do with WebMaker, although we're we're far from from even having the hand, first handful of snow. I think but we'll have it soon. All right. Well, I, I think that's a great metaphor, maybe to stop on uh, that we all need to try, try, you know figure out how to find our first handful of snow. Um, <laughs> Mark, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, fun conversation, good insights. I appreciated it. There's been some good chatter on Twitter under the Ed Startup hashtag as we've been talking along. Um, so thanks to everyone. Just a reminder that this week is the second week of the market cycle. Uh, if, if you are keeping pace with the class, uh, you ought to be going through those exercises right now. We've seen some really interesting feedback from folks on how valuable that, that uh, exercise has been to them. So I encourage you to engage in that. And uh, we will not be broadcasting next Wednesday as part of the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S. We'll see you again two weeks from now with an email uh, and a warning and reminding you about who's speaking and what time we'll be starting. And until then, we'll see you later. Sounds good.